Well, good morning to everybody. Morning. We do have a little more, uh, a little more people here than we do on Wednesday nights, but that, and that's good. Uh, if you got some coffee and donuts this morning, we're going to try to do that every time we come in on Sundays. You know, wake everybody up, get you some, some feel, and um, we'll come in here and get some of God's word. So, um, throughout, we've been doing this Bible study for a year now, exactly. We started last January. And I have to tell you, uh, there's been a lot of material that we've covered in here. And so what I want to do today is I want to, we're not going to go as in-depth as we did last January. Because last January what I did was I actually wrote down how to Bible study. Word, sentence, paragraph, you know, these kind of things. Context, you know, how who's talking, these kind of things. And so... Uh, and we broke that down, we learned that first, and then we started digging into the Word of God. Well, this year, because we've had people in here for a year, I don't want to go back that far, but I do want to introduce kind of how we run things. This will be exactly the way we do it on Wednesday nights. I guarantee you, you're not acclimated to this kind of study on Sunday mornings. It's just completely different. And what I do is I use this board, and we hit our points. And I use the PowerPoint. The only reason I use the PowerPoint is for pictures so you can see what I'm talking about uh, when we make certain points. Every Bible study that I do, I try to use a reference and a quote. So, and you're more than welcome after the Bible study, whatever, to come up here and take pictures. You know, you come up and take pictures and you can review it. You can go back and look at the references. You can go back and look at the quotes for your own individual Bible study. Um, I think it's pretty important. There's men of God uh, who, way back before our time, had a keen sense of how to study the scripture. And I am a huge fan. Um, and God's led me to these men uh, of old. And we're going to see one here in a minute. So let's get started. This is the intro to Bible study. And I'm going to start with the devotional reading. All right. This is from Will William Gurnall. This is a man that Charles Spurgeon, if you know him... He really, really talked highly of this man. This, this book was written in 1655. It's called The Christian in Complete Armor. And Charles Spurgeon used to read this. Um, John Newton, who, everybody knows who's John? John Newton, he wrote Amazing Grace. All right? So I'm going to read these two devotionals for you and show you the difference between how people talked back then and how people talk now. All right? Here we go. There are so many who profess Christ and so few who are in fact Christians. So many who go into the field against Satan and so few who come out conquerors. All may have a desire to be successful soldiers, but few have the courage and determination to grapple with the difficulties that accost them on the way to victory. All of Israel followed Moses joyfully out of Egypt. But when their stomachs were a little pinched with hunger and their immediate desires deferred, they were ready to once at once retreat. They preferred the bondage of Pharaoh to the promised blessings of the Lord. Men are no different today. How many part with Christ at the crossroads of suffering? Like Orpah, they go a short distance only. They profess the gospel and name themselves heirs to the blessings of the saints. But when put to the test, they quickly grow sick of the journey and refuse to endure Christ. For the first sign of hardship, they kiss and leave the Savior. Reluctant to lose heaven, but even more unwilling to buy it at so dear a price. If they must resist so many enemies on the way, they will contend themselves with their own stagnant cisterns and leave the water of life for others who will venture farther for it. Who among us has not learned from his own experience that it requires another spirit than the world can give to follow Christ fully? Let this exhort you then, Christian to petition God for the holy determination and bravery you must have to follow Christ. Without it, you cannot be what you profess. The fearful are those who march for hell. The valiant are those who take heaven by force. Cowards never want heaven. Do not claim that you are begotten of God and have his royal blood running in your veins unless you can prove your lineage by his heroic spirit to dare to be holy in spite of men and devils. Men do not talk like this today. Why? We're going to see in these Bible studies why. I do a lot of study on deception. I do a lot of study on the church because I feel like judgment starts in the house of the Lord. It's not 
necessarily incumbent on us to go out and judge the world. God judges them. We judge within, right? We preach the gospel to those out in the world, but we judge within. And so I have been convicted. It is my, um, um, I'm not going to say my calling, but I, I feel like God's leading me to talk to the church, okay? To edify the church with these things. Now, a couple theme verses that we use, and I just want to let you know that every time we're talking about things, we may go in and we may go out of things, but we always come back to the scripture. It's always going to focus back on the scripture, and it's always going to come back to the gospel in the end. So let's turn to these verses right quick. Luke 24. When I first started doing these Bible studies, these are the verses that we started using. Describe the scriptures and how important they are. Luke 24, verse 13. <clears throat> and behold, two of them went to the same day to a village called Emmaus. This is right after the Lord Jesus Christ has, has resurrected. Mary has already went to the tomb. Uh, she came back and tell, told the disciples, and they have went to the tomb and seen that Jesus is not there. Then there's two disciples that go on the road to Emmaus, and this is the story. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together and all these things about all these things that, that had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not, hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we trusted that it had been which he should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished when they, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it, even as the, the woman had said. But him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Let's turn to John 5. John 5, verse 39. <clears throat> Search the scriptures. He's talking to the Pharisees. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, <clears throat> and you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. <clears throat> How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believed not his writings, how should you believe my words? What's he saying? Moses wrote about him. And you believe Moses? Or if you don't believe me, you don't believe Moses. So none of the things that you're studying matter because you don't believe him. Because the things I'm saying, he wrote about me. Turn to Acts 11. Last one. You mean 17? Uh, 17, yes, yeah, sorry. 17, 11. <clears throat> Paul has just come from Thessalonica. He gets kicked out of there. They run him out. He goes to Berea. And it says in verse 11. 
These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. These three verses are <clears throat> very important as we study the scriptures, because not only does it tell us that the Lord Jesus showed his own disciples the scriptures and the pictures of him throughout the Old Testament. He tells the Pharisees that you, you say you believe Moses, which, and he wrote of me, which tells you that the Lord Jesus Christ was written about in Moses or uh, in the Pentateuch in the Old Testament. And then right here we see the Bereans not even believe in an apostle of God, right? They say, we're not going to believe him. We're going to go to the scriptures ourselves and search it out. So the reason I use these is because this is what we all should do when it comes to individual study. I am a man. I am capable of fault. I am capable of um, failure. And so I don't expect anybody to take me at my word. You know, I, I believe that God has sent me to do this. But I think that he expects all of us to go back on our own and test what I have said. So, a little review into what we did last year, and I just wrote a couple. We did, we did 48 studies last year, so these are just a little tidbit. Um, I do want to let you know, too, that these studies are built, they're built on uh, accumulation. We do study upon study, we, we pile studies upon studies, and so we refer back and we, we tie things in. And, um, but we did the tabernacle and the high priest showed the pictures of the high priest and the priestly garments, the tabernacle and the coverings and all the things in there, how they pointed to the Lord Jesus, how they pointed, pointed to the gospel and us. We studied a lot of Jewish history, uh, covered a lot of span of spans of time and how those things got brought in together uh, in the New Testament. We studied deception a lot in the church about how the Babylonian influence is coming into the church. And we're going to see a lot more of that as we go through these studies, God willing. We covered a lot about sin. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Greek words. One thing I like to do in here is I like to break down Greek words. The reason I like to do that is because this Bible is absolutely sufficient. The King James English Bible is absolutely sufficient. But there's words in there that may be confusing or you haven't heard. Uh, they're modern English and a lot of things we're not using today. So we break them down to the Greek so you can get a full picture. I want to show you an example of that. All right. The Greek and the Hebrew are the inspired text. Those were the languages that God inspired the men to write them in. So it's important that we study those things. Unity. I talked about unity in the church. Uh, very important. Tongues. We spoke about Pentecostals and tongues and how that related to uh, God telling the children of Israel to come back to Jerusalem. And we talked about Pentecost and all these kind of things tied in. We, we broke down a book, 1 Thessalonians, uh, the letter. Resurrection Sunday, if you were in this classroom over here, we, we broke down uh, the whole trial of the Lord Jesus Christ and the crucifixion and, and the resurrection uh, in a much different way than probably you've ever seen. And we're going to do that same thing this year with some added things into it. So it's going to be interesting. We talked about self versus God. Which is uh, basically one of the main themes in the Bible. Self versus God. And then pictures and shadows. We, we discussed a lot of that last year. Now what to expect. I wrote down a couple things here. About what to expect from these studies. I am pretty much guaranteeing. That. There's people that's been going to church for 30, 40 years. That are probably not going to hear or they haven't heard a lot of the things that you're going to hear here because they, there is a I like to do in-depth study I want the people of God to get the meat of the scriptures I feel like the church today there's a lot of milk they're feeding on a lot of milk and the reason is, is because they're carnal Paul says they're carnal they they can't understand it but it's my goal that we Get a loving desire for the word of God, prayer, asking God for wisdom. And we come in here and we study the Bible in depth, spiritually discerning the Bible. Okay. So one, what, what to expect? We need to know that these Bible studies and this word of God is all about the Lord Jesus. 
If we don't understand that, we cannot understand this. It is all about him. And we've seen last year that I mean, almost everything, almost every page, almost every, you know, almost every chapter is about him. It points to him. So it's all about him. Second, this Bible is spiritually discerned. It takes, uh, and I just want to say this, the natural man, the unregenerate, unsaved person cannot understand the word of God. They can go back and study it. They can see the history and they can know that there's a Jewish people and they can know that there's Israel and things like this, but they do not understand it. Their heart has not been plowed up and has not been tilled up by God uh, to the point where they are born again and then they see the scriptures in a whole new light. It's impossible. An unsaved man cannot understand the scripture the way it's supposed to be uh, understood. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I didn't make that up. Paul said that we, a, a man who is unsaved cannot understand this word of God. All right. There's a verse right here in first Timothy three, seven, that says that men are ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. This is specifically talking about pastors and teachers and preachers. These men are not saved. They're not born again, but they're up in the pulpit. They're preaching to the church. But, and they're ever learning. They're constantly getting these books in these libraries and, and they're just piling on this knowledge. But it has nothing to do with the word of God spiritually because he's unsaved. And so what is he doing? It's a detriment to the church. It's a detriment to the people. It's a detriment to the sheep. He is not feeding them spiritual things. He's only giving them worldly knowledge. Third thing. Yes, sir. Uh, that quote is actually in 2 Timothy 3 7. Oh, 2 Timothy, yeah. sorry. 2 okay, Timothy. Next thing. These studies are not, now listen to me. These studies are not for the unbeliever. If anybody can tell me in the Word of God that there's one time. Where there was a meeting of the saints and there was unbelievers there. I would like somebody to show me that because it's not there. The word, the word church, the called out ones are children of God. So when we meet here and we do Bible studies, it's not geared toward an unbeliever. So if you're an unbeliever in here, I'm glad you're here because God has led you here to hear the word of God. But it's not geared toward you. It's geared toward the believer. Again, I am convicted that I want to edify the church. I want to build up the church so that we can, we feel equipped to go out into the world. We are not supposed to, and this is my conviction as well, because I don't see it in the word of God, preach the gospel per se uh, as we would to the saved members of the church in here. We are to go out. There's not one time that says bring the unbeliever in. It says to go out into the world. Go out into the streets. Every one of the disciples and the apostles went out. They didn't bring him into the assembly and preach the gospel there. They brought everybody in and they learned the word of God. They fellowship like that. You see? So there's a difference. And so my Bible studies are not geared toward unbelievers. I'm not here to uh, what Paul says to rehash or relearn the doctrines of Christ, relearn baptism, or relearn, you know, these certain things. We're not here to teach that. Those are things that unbelievers are starting to learn. We've already learned those things. Who do we have faith in? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? We are born again of, from above. We are born again from God. We know that. So we need to learn how to seek God in here. If we continuously rehash the same message, same message, same message over and over again, we learn nothing. We learn nothing. And let me tell you, there are many, many things to learn in this Bible. There are many things to learn. Again, 
We study by acclamation. We pile things on top of each other. We'll start basically and then we start adding the building blocks. I've said many times in here that the word of God is like a puzzle. And it's mathematical in its precision. As we start studying, you'll see. I mean, it fits just as perfect as can be if you know how to look for it, if you know how to search it out. I also want to let you know, too, that by your flesh, even though you are born again, by your flesh, if you're getting in and you're just reading page after page after page after page after page, you're not going to find nothing. You're not going to find nothing. God has to lead you into things. All right, and you'll see. This thing is a, this is the way I uh, heard it uh, pictured. It's like a, it's like a block of gold. <laughs> this is the most precious thing on this earth, this written word of God. And it's like a block of gold. But you have, God has given us the ability and through asking wisdom from him to piece the little pieces of gold together. You see, there's little pieces of gold all throughout it that we have to piece together. And they all fit together. It's like a puzzle. How important is it to do individual study and not only uh, come to church and hear the word of God? Very important, right? Very important. Um, all scripture is, I want to make this point too before we continue. All scripture is given to us. This whole Bible is given to us for instruction, correction, reproof, right? Admonition. We are, we are to take it and we're to learn. There's examples in there all throughout the, the Old Testament and, and how we're supposed to live and how God's speaking to people and how God's using people. And it, and it, and it helps us and it corrects us and it convicts us, right? But not the, the whole Bible is not talking to us, is it? It's not speaking directly to us in that circum, certain circumstance. For instance... Is the book of Exodus speaking about us? Literally. Or is it speaking about the children of Israel? It's giving the timeline from when they went from Egypt, right, in that, out to the wilderness, and then they're starting to come into the promised land. That's not talking about us, is it? That's speaking of the children of Israel. So it's not directly talking about us. The Bible says to rightly divide the word of truth. When we rightly divide and we start understanding that all the part of the Bible is not talking about us, that it's about context and it's about who's speaking. What, when is it? Who's it speaking to and who is speaking? Those are very important things. And those, when we're doing our individual studies, we need to know that not necessarily was the book of Esther. There's a lot of things that we can learn. There's a lot of examples that we can take from that and see God working and things like that. And a lot of pictures, but it's not speaking of us. It's speaking of Esther and uh, Ahasuerus, you know, her, you know, all these and what was going on in Babylon and all this Persia. Now, the reason I say individual study is important is because let me ask you this. The rapture. Everybody's heard of this, right? Show of hands, well, we don't, I don't do a show of hands, but everybody in here who believes that there's going to be a seven year tribulation and then before that tribulation, the pre-tribulation, there's going to be the rapture of the church. Church can be out of here. And then there's going to be a tribu seven year tribulation and then there's going to be a millennial reign, right? Amen, amen, amen. Okay. Most Baptists believe that. All right? Most Baptists believe this. I'm not saying that it's not true. And I'm not saying I'm not going to be dogmatic about anything because there's a lot of different things that people say. And there's a lot of different ways to look at it, right? But how do you know that? How is it that you came to that conclusion? This rapture doctrine. If you believe that, how is it that you came to that? Did you parse it out yourself? Did you study it yourself? Or was it something? I'm not directly talking to you. I, you know, I'm just it overall. It didn't say the rapture, but it said that we'll all meet together in his life. Right. Right. Exactly. And see, there's many people look at it differently, right? They, they'll say, well, it's not going to happen until after this. Or this is not going to happen until before this. Or there's a pre-trib. Or there's a post. You know, there's just all these kind of different things, if, if, if you know anything about it. The point I'm trying to make is, do not... Get your 
complete understanding of the Word of God only from coming here and learning what the preacher's telling him. Because he's just a man. And he can, he can sit in that pulpit and he can, he's got his own views of things, right? He's got his own view and he's going to, and he's targeted on that. He knows his view. He's going to teach you that view, okay? Most of the time. And so as that view gets projected, you take it in. What I'm warning you of is don't just take that. Go home and study what he said. Write everything down. Go home and study what he says. And then if he's... If it's biblical, <laughs> you know, then, then you can agree with it. That's what I'm saying. Don't just get your doctrine from coming in here. Go home and do your own study. That's, what, that's all I'm getting at. Now, I want to give you an example of what happens when you don't do your own individual study. When you do nothing but follow people into things. All right? There's the Bible. Um, you might not be able to read this, but this says Christ alignment. All right? Christ alignment. Now, what this is, you see these cards here? This is Bethel Church in California. This is a Christian church. They have brought tarot cards, daily reading, palm readings. They call them destiny cards. Fortune telling. This is in the Christian church. What church is that? Bethel Church. Really? Yes, sir. In California. This is also for the younger people. There's a there's a group called Jesus Culture. Yeah. This is where the this is where that comes from. There's also a thing called Jesus School. This comes from that. And if you go on YouTube and watch these things, the Bible is clear that it says to be sober minded, to be sound of sound mind. These people are intoxicated with evil spirits. The Bible is clear that says, when it says no divination, you know, no wizards or witches or things like that. These people have brought witchcraft into the church. And we're going to study a little bit more into this just to show you how in depth this goes. But it's called ChristAlignment.org. You can go look at it. And I want to read something from their, their page. Just to give you an idea of why it's so important that you do your own study. Because what these people have done who are in this church, obviously, somebody has told them something and they say that it's of Christ. And what do they do? They just follow it. They just follow tarot cards, you know, all these things, and they just follow it. So listen to this. About Us. This is their About Us page right here on their website. The Christ Alignment team, based in Melbourne, Australia, are trained spiritual consultants gifted in various modal teams. We practice a form of supernatural healing that flows from the universal presence of the Christ. We talked about that as well, the Christ, right? We draw from the same divine energy of the Christ spirit as ancient followers did and operate only out of the third heaven realm to gain insight and revelation. Christ alignment teams are trained in destiny readings, which is tarot cards, uh, presence therapy, trauma recovery, entity cleansing, which is exorcism, uh, relationship alignment, physical healing using divine energy, dream interpretation is done using the Hebraic method, which are, which are there to facilitate deep spiritual alignment. Christ alignment encounters coming from the third heaven bring long lasting transformation and guidance. The team the teams are trained as intuitive readers and will address all client questions. Wow. That's in the Christian so-called church. Is it important that you do your own Bible study? Is it important that you ask God for wisdom and say, Lord, is this correct? Lead me in your word to show me that this is not right. And I'll tell you right now, it's one word, witchcraft, wizards, and all those things do not belong in the church. And what has happened? They fell right into it. And this is spreading like wildfire. So it's so important that we don't just follow the leader. I mean, pastors and teachers and preachers are there to, to guide you along and hopefully they're called by God. But just because, they are say, just because they say they're of God does not mean they're of God. God is a general term. I just want to let you know that. It's a general term. My God is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But these people say, I love Jesus. It's all about Jesus. There's two Jesuses in the Bible. We're going to study that. I just want to tell you that. There's two. Paul preaches on that. But individual study. Do not take me at my word. Go home and prove what I'm saying. Test everything. Paul says test everything. Prove all things. Including the men who are preaching. So. God's wisdom is above all man's wisdom. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes that men say. Was it in the word of God? The reason I'm telling you this is because these, this is what this is the foundation of these Bible studies. I want you to understand that it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is spiritually discerned. And we are not to just follow people blindly. God has given us given us the power to resist things, to test things, to learn things on our own. So when we come here, we learn, we take it in, and we go study it ourselves. This is going along with this, that God's wisdom is above our wisdom. Always. I want you to listen to this. Men, all men are mostly good. What about Christians are going to change the world and there's going to be a worldwide uh, revival. Follow your heart. Do what your heart tells you to do. These are things that the world says. And let me tell you how many people fall into that. They fall into it. But the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is desperately wicked. Desperately. Right? And I mean, it's, it, it chases after evil. Your heart. Deceitful above all things. The heart. But the world's telling you to follow your heart. You see? Mark 7, 21. All sins, fornication, adultery, theft, all these things come from the heart. They come from inside. Yes. Right? And none are good. The Bible says not one is good. Nobody. Don't ever let, don't let, ever let somebody tell you that anybody seeks after God. They don't. God comes to you. No man seeks after God. Everybody's gone astray. There's none good. No, not one. The Lord Jesus even said, I'm not good. Why do you call me good? So how in the world can the world say that all men are mostly good? No, they're not. There's not one man that's good. If you're born again, the only thing that is good in you is the, Christ, is the Lord Jesus Christ in you. Amen. That's it. Amen. Amen. That's the kind of thing I want to establish in here. It's not about us. It's not about our goodness. It's not about what I'm, you know, all the things that I'm talking about is for him. It's, it's his wisdom. It's his glory. Not us. We're here to learn about him. All right. I know that we know if you're a Baptist in here, I know, and especially if you're from the South, we know who Billy Graham is. Oh, yeah. All right. Billy Graham. Now. I had a class on Billy Graham. I didn't even write it up here, but I want to say something about Billy Graham. Everybody, he, he's considered the, the apostle, I mean, the, the, the greatest evangelist since the apostle Paul had more people uh, attend his, you know, uh, these uh, revivals and all these things that he had. And he had all these friends in the world and I mean, all these presidents. And I'm not saying that God can't use a man to do that, but let me tell you something. To be a friend of the world is to be an enmity with God. OK, now I personally believe based off this right here is a magazine article and there's a there's many of these. You can go read them based off of what Billy Graham says. He's not a Christian. Now, listen to me. I, I mean, it may be appalling to a lot of Baptists. All right. But I want to show you this is what Billy Graham said in 1978 in an article called I can't play God anymore. Now, if Billy Graham is saying this out in the public. You have to watch it, right? You, if he says one thing wrong, you have to watch everything he says, right? So listen to this. Billy Graham says, I used to play God, but I can't do that anymore. I used to believe that pagans in far off countries were lost, were going to hell if they did not have the gospel of Jesus Christ preached to them. I no longer believe that. I believe that there are other ways of recognizing the existence of God through nature, for instance, and plenty of other opportunities, therefore, of saying yes to God. Can I just say? Yes. 
that I heard Billy Graham myself yep. say these kind of things. And he told people there was more than one way to get to heaven. Absolutely, he does. Have to go through Christ. This is one example. Uh, and when I tell people that, they don't believe me because they believe in Billy Graham. Absolutely, I they do. The worst about it. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a question. Okay, if a person has been saved, do they go to heaven? If a person has been born again... No, oh, just saved. Yeah. Well, Same thing. Well, <laughs> instead of baptized, just being saved, can they go to heaven? To be saved is to be born again from above. So they can't go to heaven? Yes. That's, that's how you get to heaven, is to be born again. So, Even though the person doesn't believe in God anymore. If you don't believe in God, then you're not saved. Now, he was saved when he was a toddler. Who? My grandson. We, we can discuss that a little bit later. Let, let's continue on. I, we definitely need to hit that question. We can discuss that a little bit later. So Billy Graham is saying that there's more than one way. He says that, the, that people recognize things in nature, and this is basically saying yes to God. That's what he's saying. It has nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe, believe and repent. That's what the Bible says. Billy Graham says, well, I believe that people are going to be saved just by recognizing God. No, there's a lot of people that recognize nature and things that they may say, well, there may be a God out there. That's not necessarily saying that I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is God and he's been resurrected and things like that. They don't believe the gospel. That's right. You see? And that's what Billy's saying. So be careful is what I'm telling you. This is what I'm showing you. If you don't want to believe that Billy Graham is not what I say he is, Go do your own research. Don't prove me. All right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you're born in the deepest, darkest part of Africa, and everybody's got a God. Are you telling me all those people are going to go to hell because they don't know Jesus Christ? I don't believe that. We can, we can discuss that. Yeah. We can discuss that later. We, we've got a, a little bit of time here. So, saying that... <laughs> Billy Graham's wisdom is not God's wisdom. Man's wisdom, follow your own heart, all these things, is not God's wisdom. God said there's none good, don't follow your own heart because it's evil above all things. And as we come into these Bible studies, I want to ensure that you count the cost of following the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? I want to show you an example of this. This is a Greek word that we're about to break down. All right? And show you how this works and show you that there's a lot of words in the Bible that you may not un really understand what they mean. But when we break it down, you'll see clearly what they mean. Turn to Luke 14. Luke 13, sorry. Starting at verse 23. Then said, one of, uh, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able to. Now, that word strive. Who knows what a concordance is? Bible concordance. All right. A Bible concordance is, if you don't know, it's a book that a man named, his last name is Strong, John. John, I think it's John Strong. He, he has wrote this book. It's about this thick and it's got every single word in the Bible and it's got the Greek and Hebrew meanings of it. All right. If you don't have one, you need to get one because this is how you study the word of God. Okay. I've got two of them. Good. So the word strive there in verse... 24. Strive to enter in. What does that word strive mean? Anybody? Work at it. What is that? Work at it? Okay. Yes. It's a struggle. Struggle. All right. So the word is agonitsumai. That's the Greek word. Right. Agony. Yes. The word is agonitsumai. And it comes from the root word agon. All right. The word agon is. The Greek Colosseum. This is where they used to, 
the gladiators used to go in there and fight, you know, and then the, the Christians would be sent in there and they'd give to the lions, just these big games, right? They would have these big games in these coliseums, sort of look like a football game, you know, and they would watch these violent things happen, fighting and struggling with gladiators. That word agon gives us the word agonitsubai, which means to struggle or to contend or to fight. We get our word agonize from that. So let's change the word up there. Agonize to enter in at the straight gate. Agonize over what? Agonize over your sin. Agonize over uh, the wisdom of this world brings sorrow. There's an agony that comes with following the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who laugh now will weep later. Those who weep now will laugh later. You see, there's an agony that happens here on this earth that we are not supposed to be like the world, partying and laughing it up and giggling and all this stuff, whatever the case may be. There should be a sorrow and a sobriety about us and a agonizing within. If you are born again, there is a war going on within you or it should be on the inside. And that war is the inner man who is Christ in you, the hope of glory, the spirit of God who is warring with your flesh. Your flesh wants to go out and just do all these things and sin and all these things. Paul says, paraphrase, I want to do good, but I can't. My flesh, I follow the law of sin with my flesh, but I follow the law of God with my spirit. There's a war that's happening. And if that war is not going on within you, you need to question. And you need to ask God, am I saved? Am I born again, Lord? I cry out to him. Because it's not an easy life. And I'll show you this. Narrow is the way, right? Narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Few. Why? You see, when we look at the word narrow, enter ye into the straight gate, for narrow is the way. The word straight is not the word straight, like a straight line. It's straight. As in the Strait of Gibraltar, there's two islands or two continents that come together and there's just this little space like this that ships go through to get to the other ocean. He's telling you that the, the way is narrow. I mean, or that you're going to come through the strait, but the way is narrow. And it doesn't mean a narrow passage. The word narrow in the Bible, it comes from four different words. This is how, this is how great the Greek just builds up and shows you how it is. Four words make up this word narrow. Philippo, trebo, trauma, we all know what that is, and trumo. I'm going to show you what all four of those words mean to make up that word narrow. It means break in pieces, to be broken into pieces, to be wounded, to go on a worn path, and to be pressed like grapes. That's the narrow way. That same word, it's only used one time in the Bible. The other times are affliction, tribulation, throng, and trouble. If you think that you can be a Christian and not suffer and not agonize and not be broken, broken pieces and not be wounded and not be traversing the worn path and be pressed like grapes, you've got to question whether you're a Christian or not. Because that is our calling. That's what God has called us to do. To go along the narrow way. This is why people will not. There's many that will search to seek it. They'll seek it out and they will not find it. Because they want to be Christians. They want to live like this. And call themselves Christians. You see. This is also. And we're going to end here in just a second. I heard the other day. A teacher said, no, I, I'm going to look these things up myself and look up every single one of them because I don't know if I necessarily believe them or not. There's a thing. Who knows what parsing means? P-A-R-S-I-N-G. Parsing. I used to basically take it apart. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, piece by piece. Right. So every sentence in the English language, you can parse it. You can break every single word down and it'll show you whether it's an adjective or a noun or a verb or right. And then you can break every sentence down into what kind of sentence it is. A command, a statement, you know, these kind of things. Exclamation point, question mark. Right. We learned that in like third grade. 
So these principles can apply to us now as we're reading the scripture. He says that there are 1900 imperative mood sentences. Who knows what imperative mood means? Yes. Oh. <laughs> imperative mood means a command. Jesus says, strive to enter in. He's not inviting you to strive to enter in. He's telling you. That's a command. You will do this. When the Lord Jesus is walking around, he's walking around the beach, uh, you know, Capernaum or uh, the Sea of Galilee and the Peter and James and John are out there fishing. He goes, follow me. He's not saying, yeah, yeah, come on and follow me. No, he says, get over here. Get over here and follow me. It's a command. It's imperative mood. And you can go through the Bible and you can rip out every single sentence and break it all the way down. And it'll show you exactly what, what the Lord Jesus is saying. And he says that there, we think the Ten Commandments are a lot. We think that there's, the Jews say that there are 613 commandments, do's and don'ts in the Old Testament that they're supposed to follow. And they still follow on today. This man said that he parsed every imperative sentence out, command out. He says there's 1,900 of them in the New Testament. I'm going to find out and I'll let you know. But let me say, if there's even a hundred of them, that lets you know that the Lord Jesus is serious about what he's saying. This is not this is not something that we take lightly. And so as we come in here as a group, as as a group of believers, these are the things that I want us to think about. All right. This is the mindset that we should have as a Christian. I will tell you this right here. I wrote this up here that if you like fluff and you like rainbows and butterflies and you like to be tickled in the ear and you like to just, you know, hear the soft things of scripture, this Bible study is not for you. It's not for you because the Bible is clear that soft words and fair speeches are these things. The false prophets are bringing these things. Are bringing they, these things to coax you along and to use you as merchandise and to, you know, to hit, you know, it makes people feel good. I'm not here to make you feel good. I want to teach you the word of God and what he's really telling us. The way he is telling us. So, I'll summarize with this. My ultimate goal. And I wrote this down so I can make sure to hit all the points. My ultimate goal in these studies is to, for us to get a firm foundation of the Word of God and understand that it is the ultimate authority on this earth, faith and practice, the Word of God. Nothing else, not man, God, all right? I want us to understand what our relationship is with God. We are creatures meant to serve God, meant to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not divine. We are not gods ourselves. We're not. We don't have a divine spark and all these things that you'll see these people talking about once we get into these studies. We are creatures meant to serve God. I want to bring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to you in a deeper way and help you learn, equip you so you can go out and, and preach the gospel to the world. I want you to fall in love with the word of God because the more you hear it, I, trust me. The amount of people that were in here over this whole year, you can see the light, the eye, their eyes just light up and say, man, this is out. This is awesome. I've never heard this before. That's right. So yes. to give you a, a new desire, once you start hearing these things, it's going to be hard and you're going to be confronted with a lot of things that you've never been confronted with. But once you're confronted with them and once you deal with them and you talk to God about it, it completely changes the whole dynamic of Bible study. It completely changes your, your relationship with God because I feel like the church doesn't confront a lot of things. We just let things go. And the word is telling us that is telling us we just we just don't get into it. And then finally, learn how to apply it. The Bible is clear. There's a lot of things that we should apply. And I want to help us do that as well. Yes. Okay, I've been going through a lot of stress, and I've even been meeting with Pastor Baker because of depression. Well, I just got the best news this past week that I have waited for a very, very long time. My oncologist told me that the tumor was still there, but it stopped growing. He told my family doctor the tumor is gone. There is no sign of cancer. Wow, 
Outstanding. Yeah. Ham, let's give a hand. That's how it's done. Outstanding. Great job. And no signs of strokes or anything. It's just the arthritis has been giving me a lot of pain. But I'll tell you, that was the best news I could have. That's had. outstanding. Mm -hmm. Very good. See if I got anything. Okay, I just want to show you this right quick. This is, who knows what the Ouija board is? Oh, yeah, that's creepy. This church has this. It says the Bethel board. No. They call it the Bethel board. And they use this. This is in the Christian church. This is what's coming. Witchcraft is here. It's in the church. This is why we have to be sober minded, watchful. And then we got the Billy Graham there. I didn't switch to him. Are there any questions? I know we covered a lot of stuff really fast. But trust me, once we come in here on Sundays, it's going to be a lot more broken down. And just know, the pastor was right, that we were doing uh, uh, an hour and 15 minutes. You know, everybody's getting a chance to speak and things like that because I like family environment. Yeah. So when we come in here, it's up to you. But I like everybody close where we can see each other and basically, right. you know, feel each other's breath and, you know, things like that. So, yes, sir. All right. Uh, I originally said 40 minutes on this. has been 50. So we're going to start next week right at 10. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a little more time. Let's have prayer then, shall we? All right. Father, thank you for this and for Robbie and his study. And I pray that you'll help us to learn everything we can. Thank you for your love in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right.